I think the goal of this exercise is extremely important, which is a deep, quantitative visioning exercise of what Africa can achieve during the coming 40 years. And as I mentioned in the session this morning, I think what Africa can achieve in the coming 40 years is what China achieved between 1980 and 2020. 40 years in which the Chinese economy grew roughly 35 times uh, and went from poverty to a very strong economy, indeed by some measures the largest economy in the world. Africa has the same population as China, and it has the same potential as China. But it requires, uh, obviously, a, a, a deep strategy uh, to achieve this kind of result, because what China achieved resulted from a deep strategy. Uh, it was not something that just happened. It was something that was promoted by Chinese leadership, by the National Development and Reform Commission, by strategists over the course of 40 years. And this, I think, is Africa's challenge. I don't believe this can be viewed as one country at a time, even though each country has a very important role to play, because it will be the cumulative Africa-wide process that will carry each of the countries forward, help set improved policies, make financing available, and solve infrastructure problems. Africa needs an Africa-wide power pool. Africa needs uh, an Africa-wide fiber network. Africa needs an Africa-wide transportation network, both highways and, I would say, especially fast rail. And that means that no country on its own can accomplish this. These are big projects. They require a lot of financing. They require a lot of cooperation <coughs> from the countries. I think the progress that the African Union has made in the last 10 years is extremely important because it is only in the last 10 years that the real idea of a single market and an integrated prioritization of Africa-wide infrastructure has come to the fore. So I think that the base for this kind of development really wasn't there 20 years ago. Individual countries could do their best, often surrounded by a lot of chaos in their neighborhood, but it was very hard to get this kind of long-term rapid development. Now, I think what's crucial is that at the base, long-term rapid development comes from investments. And rapid growth comes from high levels of investment relative to the size of the existing economy. So to grow faster means to invest a higher proportion of GDP. What is crucial, though, to understand is that these investments are both public and private. So there's no possibility to say we're going to have private sector-led growth. That's not possible. Of course, private sector is crucial. But without the public sector, there's no private sector-led growth. And the reason is that there are really at the core four kinds of investments that need to be made. The first is physical infrastructure. Power, fiber, roads, transport, water and sanitation, urban infrastructure. And these are by and large public sector investments. Of course, the private sector can contribute but I don't know of a single country where the private sector does this on its own because these are monopoly sectors. So if you hear about the privatization of 
the utility sector don't believe it. Nobody has a private utility sector. They may have private utilities that are publicly regulated, but this is a public investment, and that's crucial. The second investment, is, and the most important fundamentally, is in human capital. First, basic health care, nutrition, healthy brain development, healthy child development. It's fundamental, obviously. And then children in school learning. Africa needs all of its school-age children in school, all of them. This is not so hard to accomplish, but I'll come back to it in a moment. But that is a public effort. No private sector is going to solve that problem. What the private sector does with health and education is cater to the top 1% or the top 5% or the top 10% of the population. But that's not economic development. Economic development is ensuring that all children have at least an upper secondary completion. But I would aim, and I think this study should aim, that 30% or more of African young people have a university degree by 2040 or so. Absolutely achievable, even faster especially with online education. So this is the second area of investment. It's public. No business is going to come other than to take oil and gas or cobalt unless there are skilled people in the workforce. What a business wants is, are there managers locally? Are there engineers locally who can manage the technologies? Are there uh, people who can be a good interface with the international community. That's all education. And so this education as the second fundamental part <coughs> or human capital is critical. The third is business development. And of course that's overwhelmingly private sector. And it's both domestic businesses and international businesses. But I tell you, if there's no electricity, they're not coming. If they have to depend on their own diesel generator, they're not coming. If they can't find skilled workers, they're not coming. If there isn't decent water and sanitation, half of manufacturing can't function. And the fourth kind of capital is the environmental capital. This continent is uniquely blessed with natural capital, and it's uniquely threatened now. It's under a lot of stress. And so there's going to have to be a lot of investment to protect the nature, to stop the deforestation, to protect the ecosystems to protect the wildlife, which is key for tourism, aside from everything else. And that requires a lot of investment as well. So the core that I'm emphasizing is we need a smart investment strategy more than anything else. And that investment has to be comprehensive. And I feel very much for the minister, and I want to turn to this now, when she says, I have to pick and choose. My budget does not allow this. Do you know that most African budgets right now do not have enough revenues to keep all children in school, period? It's not a matter of desire or not. It's a hard bottom line. Africa has a large young population. Sometimes 35 or 40 percent of the entire population is school age. And schooling costs something. There have to be teachers. The teachers have to be paid. There needs to be physical infrastructure. And if you're a finance minister and a minister of education comes to you and says, this is the real bill 
for universal upper secondary completion and for having enough higher education, a finance minister is going to say, that's wonderful, I agree completely, but I can't pay for this. That's 20% of GDP, you're asking me. That's my whole budget, my entire revenues. <coughs> so these are the challenges that need to be addressed. I, by the way, fault the international system terribly that when Minister D'Souza goes to the IMF, they don't care whether the children are in school or not. I guarantee you there's no page in an Article 4 consultation checking on that fact. They don't care whether the health system has universal health coverage. It's terrible. And you know why? Because they don't care. Honestly. Just if you had any doubts. So you have to care because no one else cares. This is really important. You've got to get the kids in school. You've got to get the health coverage. You've got to get the electrification. And you can't be told, sorry, you have to wait. Your budget doesn't allow it, so you'll have to go another 10 years without electricity in half your country. Do you know what that means? That means 10 years from now, the situation will be more desperate. The population will have increased 30 or 40 percent. Children will not have gone to school. The envir physical environment will be worse. And there will be no business development. And you'll be blamed. You see no governance. So it's a bunch of nonsense, actually. And what we need to show is what is the scenario to get out of this. Now, I don't have all of the answers by any means. That's why I'm so interested in this study. But I do believe in one thing that is really key and completely different from what my former students at the IMF and the World Bank believe. And that is that African governments should take on a lot more debt and use it to keep the kids in school, to build the electricity, to build the rail, to build the transport systems because it can't wait. And if you do it right, the growth will be rapid so that what looks like a lot of debt today, 25 years from now, won't be very much debt at all. But the problem with my analysis, obviously, is I believe that Africa needs financing on 30-year borrowing not on five-year euro bonds, which is nonsense, because development is a 30-year process. It is not a five-year process. And if you borrow for five years, you'll get into debt trouble, because you'll still be illiquid five years on. You'll be starting your investments. The kids in first grade will be in sixth grade. So what? Your debt will come due. And then they'll tell you, you're in a debt crisis. Now you need austerity. And nobody thinks very hard about how to break this. But the way to break this is long-term finance. And that's one reason why I believe that the African Development Bank is completely central to this story. Because the AFDB should be borrowing on behalf of Africa at a much, much, much larger rate. And than lending at maybe 10 times the amount that it lends now. And for 30-year low-interest loans that enable Angola to have every child in school, completely. So 20 years from now, completely different situation in the country. And everybody has electricity. And everybody uh, has uh, the basics that they need. And then, by the way, you have an incredibly creative population all over the continent. Boy, they're so creative, they make do with nothing. Imagine when they have all of the backing with them, then the possibilities are endless in so many areas. So to my mind, finance is central. So how to do this? Let me just give you a couple of tips. 
The World Bank will never give you the right answer, unfortunately. It's too close to the White House. <laughs> it's at 18th in Pennsylvania. The White House is at 16th in Pennsylvania. The executive office of the president is at 17th in Pennsylvania. The IMF is at 19th in Pennsylvania. It's very tough. But you've got friends all over the place. And you need to use the friends all over the place. China is crucial for Africa's future development, no question. Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries are crucial for Africa's development, no question. A lot of money there, a lot of capital to tap into. India will be crucial for Africa's development. There will be a lot of money to tap into. Don't just look to the U.S. and Europe. Look for novel solutions for this financing. And have a foreign policy that is friendly with everybody and closed off to nobody and has nothing to do with who's number one in the world and number two, which is the only issue that matters to the United States. Otherwise, they don't care about anything. They just want to know they're number one. I don't know what even that means. But you have lots of sources of capital. And by the way, the cost of a 30-year loan, triple A, is 3%. Imagine if Africa could finance its development at 3% 30 year borrowing. Believe me, the issues would be finished because you'd be on your way. This would be the biggest construction site in the whole world in history. Roads, power, housing, new factories. Now, the problem is Africa borrows at 13% on five years right now. This Eurobond stuff is useless, worse than useless. I wouldn't take any borrowing at less than 20-year maturity, anything. Because you can't run development on a year-by-year -year basis. And that's why what uh, Professor Aroma was just showing, all these swings are basically finance swings. Commodities prices are high, finance is easy, you borrow, commodities prices come down, finance is tough, then austerity. All that Africa's suffering is finance swings. And so what this study will show is the underlying strategy, which to my mind is a high investment rate in skills, in health, in physical infrastructure, and in business development. And it will show that that will produce growth of 7 to 10% per year. And I always teach my students the rule of 70, which is divide 70 by the growth rate, and that tells you the doubling time. So if you are growing 10% per year, 70 divided by 10 is 7. The economy doubles every seven years. That's what China did. In 35 years, it doubled five times. If you double five times, it's two times two times two times two times two. 32 <coughs> time increase in GDP in 35 years. That's what Africa can do. And then what looks like unpayable debt is nothing. Because you divide by 35. What difference if it's 200% of GDP today? Because the GDP is going to be 30 times larger in 30 years. But this way you'll have electricity, children in school, and the things that you need. So to my mind, that's what we're really, really about. And <coughs> I'm convinced it's possible. I think the timing is right. I think the geopolitics are good. If it were still just a US dominated world, I'd be more pessimistic. But the rise of China, the rise of India, the rise of Brazil as a regional power means you have lots of friends all over the place. 
lots of partnerships in business all over the place, lots of pools of capital. And I'd go to the Gulf and I'd say, we want you to put it into the African Development Bank and we'll leverage it three or four times and we will absolutely deliver the core infrastructure for the continent. So to my mind, this geopolitical situation combined with the increase in capacity and vision and determination of the African Union itself makes a circumstance that gives reality to a rapid growth scenario. And this project will be the first ever quantified rapid growth scenario to say this isn't just dreams. Here it is, statistical work absolutely based on known properties, on standard uh, analytics, but showing a different path from the one that has been imposed by lack of imagination and lack of caring, and one that is now possible through this kind of uh, high-level politics that's coming properly into shape. So I'm extremely excited by this work. Thank you.